Lord of Mysteries, Chapter 1195 Grade 0 In the region that had been concealed, the Saint of Secrets, Bodies, narrowed his eyes slightly as he recognized Lemano's travels. This made him no longer have any doubts about the intel provided by Saint Tenebris Kisma. He recognized this notebook and knew that it was a mystical item that the Abraham family placed great importance on. It was one of the most powerful items below the high sequences, and the negative effects were negligible. Heh, back when I was a mid-sequence Bayonder, I had yearned for this notebook so much. In the end, the Abraham family was wary of me and didn't place any importance on my needs at all. Now, have they learned their lesson? This woman shouldn't be a descendant of the Abraham family. Otherwise, she wouldn't have gone around searching for the cursed item of an ancient wraith. Bodies muttered inwardly as his expression gradually turned grim, showing hints of a cruel fervor. After observing his surroundings for a while, he carefully reached into his black robe's pocket. The pocket seemed to contain a vast space as Saint of Secrets Bodies dragged out a three-layered jewelry box from within. This jewelry box wasn't tiny, making it difficult to hold it with one hand. It was mainly silver black in color, and its surface was covered with exquisite decorations. There were rubies, emeralds, sapphires, and diamonds embedded in it, making it look rather luxurious. As he held the jewelry box in his hands, there was a hint of panic and fear in his expression. It was as if he was facing the abyss or listening to an evil god's ravings. The gathering continued as usual. Frizz put away Leimano's travels and focused on listening to the participants, as though she was seeking some answers. During this process, she would occasionally ask questions, using gold pounds and spiritual materials as payment. However, she didn't receive any effective answers. Gradually, the Bayonder gathering came to an end. The host arranged for the different participants to leave from different exits. Soon, only Fors and a few other Bayonders were left in the room. After receiving the signal of the host, Fors stood up and resisted the urge to stretch herself as she walked towards the side door. At this moment, she realized that her body had stiffened. Her head could barely turn, but it felt like she was a toy that had its torsion spring wound up. From the corner of her eye, she saw that the grayish-white walls had turned silvery black in an instant. They were covered in granules, as though they were made of metal. The remaining participants and the host had their skin lose the luster that it should have possessed. Their eyes were dull, their movements mechanical, as though they were large dolls. In the concealed area, Bodies had opened the jewelry box at some point in time. The interior of its top layer wasn't exquisite enough, but it had completely restored the scene of the room. In the room, there were chairs and long tables scattered haphazardly. There were a few palm-sized puppets sitting or standing, as though they were trying to simulate reality. Among these people, the person standing was wearing a hooded robe. The shape of her chin was beautiful and her lips were plump and red. It was none other than Force. She and the remaining Bayonders, together with the gathering's host, had silently become toys. They had been taken into the highest layer of the jewelry box. The room that connected in the external world was only left with grayish-white walls, nothing else. The corners of Bodies's lips curled up bit by bit. With his right hand, he closed the lid of the jewelry box. In just a single breath, he had magically controlled his target. This silver-black, three-layered jewelry box was the grade zero sealed artifact that he had snatched from the Abraham family. As it had never been obtained by the Orthodox churches, nor was it ever deeply understood, it didn't have a corresponding number. According to what Bodies knew, this jewelry box originated from an Abraham family angel from the fourth epoch. He enjoyed roaming the cosmos and heading to different places in the vast universe. However, once, when he returned to his family to rest, he died silently in his palace. His face was filled with fear, and his expression was twisted as if he had seen something extremely terrifying. A true mythical creature, one that could be considered a subsidiary god in the second epoch had actually died silently without causing a stir. The death was extremely bizarre. The Bayonder characteristic he left behind combined with his corpse, forming the jewelry box that was quite different from the other kind of sealed artifacts. And back then, Mr. Dor, Bethel Abraham, not only didn't attempt to shatter it and restore it to a pure Bayonder characteristic, he had even given it a rather strange name, Box of the Great Old Ones. The first level of the Box of the Great Old Ones could turn the target's location into toys and switch locations with its interior. Bodies had used this trait to easily achieve his goal. The second level of the Box of the Great Old Ones recorded different locations. Once it was released, the holder and the living beings within its effective range would head directly to the corresponding region. They would then wander around the cosmos like the angel from the Abraham family back then, exploring the universe. As for what was on the third level of the box of the Great Old Ones, Bodies knew about it but didn't dare to think about it. It was just like how he usually didn't dare come into contact with this Grade Zero sealed artifact. 
Smack. After closing the lid of the box of the great old ones, he grabbed the mirror that was embedded in the transparent vortex that was suspended in midair with his right hand. Once a certain area was concealed, a secret sorcerer had to use the corresponding door or directly remove the concealment to exit. Bodies had chosen the latter method because it was the easiest and fastest method. The shadows stirred, and the area that disappeared returned to the real world. The room was finally complete. Bodies didn't stay any longer. Without even looking at his surroundings, he made his body rapidly fade away. He held the many-gemmed, silver-black box of the Great Old Ones as the colors saturated and overlapped with each other. He traversed the spirit world which was filled with strange creatures towards his designated location. In a few seconds, he walked out of the void, attempting to enter the ruins of the Battle of the Gods by crossing the huge chasm that split the seas. At this moment, the Bodies stopped in midair. His eyes narrowed and his eyes instantly turned dark, dotted with countless points of resplendence. It was like the cosmos had been reflected in his eyes. The gravel formed by the stars spun rapidly, causing the cracks at the bottom of the sea to rapidly turn incorporeal, causing everything in front of him to shrink and condense into a wavering orange flame. This flame extended from the tip of a matchstick as it was extinguished. Everything that Bodhis had experienced after removing the concealed space was an illusion. He remained rooted to the ground and the source of this illusion was the burning matchstick. The matchstick was held by a fair-skinned palm, and the owner of the hand was a woman wearing a purple-patterned black robe and a hood. She was sitting on a carriage that was halfway through the wall, formed from a gigantic pumpkin. Pulling the carriage were a bunch of gray rats. This was none other than Catalia, but her appearance, image, and bearing had changed. This was the power she gained from the magic of Cinderella. The core Bayonder power of the Mystery Prior Pathways Sequence for Mysticologist was called Mystical Reenactment, fully expressing the saying, Knowledge is power. To put it simply, a mysticologist could draw power from different mysticism knowledge they grasped, and create all sorts of magic or witchcraft. As for the corresponding mysticism knowledge, the less that was known by others and the less it spread, the more powerful the spells became. The contrary could also be established. Once some knowledge and legends were known to many and no longer mysterious, the magic or witchcraft created by drawing on its powers would become almost ineffective. Catalia had no idea why the queen could create all kinds of magical powers that were rich in magical colors from the private fairy tales that Emperor Roselle had told her, but that didn't hinder her learning and usage of them. After all, she had heard of those fairy tales from Queen Mystic. The magic she had used it to temporarily transform and disguise herself was called Cinderella. The magic that threw Saint of Secrets bodies into an illusion was the Little Match Girl. With that, she had used it to stop the other party from teleporting away, creating an opportunity for the battle that would follow. Just as Bodies had extricated himself from the hallucination, the Cinderella who was sitting in the pumpkin carriage placed her foot on the ground and spread out her arms, causing a huge cross to appear behind her. As for Catalia, she seemed to be carrying an illusory object. In the empty room, candle lights lit up, one after another, illuminating a long table covered with flesh and blood. Around the long table were three extremely blurry figures holding the globs of flesh as they constantly devoured the food. As if sensing something, the three figures turned their heads at the same time and looked at Bodhis. This saint of secrets' heart raced as he felt a chill rush out from deep within his soul. He then heard illusory gnawing, chewing, and digesting sounds. He could feel the undisguised malice and hunger. Bodhis's eyelid twitched. He hurriedly lowered his head and cast his gaze at the box of the great old ones in his hand. The silver black box had opened itself without him realizing it at some point in time. The magic that Catalia used was called the Feast of Betrayal. It stemmed from the mysticism knowledge she learned of the ancient sun god's death from the tarot club. Its purpose was to temporarily awaken or imbue the target with intelligence, allowing them to commit a betrayal. Without a doubt, the effects of encountering a sealed artifact that was filled with malice towards the owner would be excellent. However, if not for the fact that she had obtained the protection of Mr. Fool at every gathering they monitored, Catalia wouldn't have dared to use this magic. Once the three main leads of the betrayal feast sensed it, she would definitely die for obscure reasons. She wouldn't be able to resist her death and would die an abnormally horrifying death. Therefore, mysticologists were definitely individuals with high risk. Their strength came from walking the edge of the abyss, coming from things they shouldn't have seen or heard. In comparison, Queen Mystic who could create magic from her father's private fairy tales was much safer than other mysticologists at the same tier. Chapter 1196 The Ugly Duckling 
When opening the first level of the box of the great old ones, the long table, chairs, fours, and the others were like dolls. They were either still or motionless. Otherwise, under the power of torsion springs, they made repeated simple movements. Upon seeing this scene, Bodiz's hair stood on end. For some baffling reason, he felt that he was about to join and become one of them. He instinctively wanted to react to the grade zero sealed artifact in his hand, but he saw the hooded, purple-robed woman retract her right hand and hold it to her mouth, slightly clenched. A dark color instantly formed in her palm. It was an ancient bugle with a charm that appeared very heavy and powerful. The horn of magic, the horn of destruction. Bodhis's pupils dilated as he lacked the luxury of time to deal with the box of the great old ones. He grabbed forward with his right hand, as though he had raised an invisible screen that shielded the void. The area he was in was distorted once again. He disappeared and was concealed. Woo. The horn in Cadley's hand let out a soft hum. It echoed in the room but didn't extend out of its confines. With the sound waves overlapping, the shadows shattered and the ground cracked. The space that had been concealed by the Saint of Secrets was like a thick piece of glass that had been struck by a sledgehammer. Countless cracks appeared and intertwined with each other. Elsewhere, a towering knight in full black armor appeared out of the shadows. He held a long broadsword, and two dark red beams of light glimmered in his eye sockets. Saint Tenebris Kisma. Woo. Once again, Catalia blew the horn. Everything in the room seemed to freeze into a translucent amber. Silently, the amber broke apart, and even the black-armored knight fell to the ground like a mirror, shattering into small shards. The distorted region returned to the real world. However, Bodhis also managed to grab the gaps between the two horn blows as he created numerous illusory doors to appear around them. Some of them were double doors that opened outwards, some were deep and recessed, some were covered in mysterious patterns and some were hollow in the middle, allowing one to vaguely see the boundless darkness behind them. The illusory doors were in bountiful numbers, densely packed, and overlapped together, almost enveloping the Saint of Secrets. Without any time to think further, Bodhis immediately opened a grayish-blue door with seven brass locks, and he threw the box of the great old ones that was just about to have its second layer open inside. This was a secret sorcerer's exile. It could throw a target that he had gained initial control of into a corresponding chaotic space. As for the different illusory doors, they represented different scenes, ones where danger and opportunity coexisted. This kind of exile wasn't permanent. At Bodhis's sequence level, he was only capable of isolating the box of the Great Old Ones from reality for 20 seconds. Once that time was up, the Grade Zero sealed artifact would return to the spot beside him through the illusory door from before. However, by then, the betrayal induced by the enemy's Beyonder powers would definitely have disappeared. As a demigod of the Apprentice Pathway, he had traveled many places, witnessed many things, and recorded many kinds of powers. Bodhis made the most correct decision in that split instant. At the same time, the Black Knight that had split into pieces quickly squirmed and reformed, becoming a thin rug that flowed with flesh and blood. It covered every corner of the room. As a cult that could only survive in the shadows of reality, the Aurora Order might have many lunatics, but they were used to doing things to conceal themselves so as to prevent themselves from attracting the official Bayonders before their goals were met. Of course, once the matter was in its final stages, they would definitely proclaim their existence openly. In addition, Saint Tenebris Kisma had done so in hopes of obstructing the possible enemies that were hiding outside to a certain extent. This allowed a separation of the battlefield. When a layer of flesh grew out from the floor, walls, and ceiling, a twisted black shadow rose up from the corner. This was one of the souls that Saint Tenebris Kisma had grazed. It was a powerful vampire from the forsaken land of the gods, a sequence for shaman king of the moon pathway. If the shepherd's grazed target was a demigod, he could release it directly due to the existence of its corporeal spirit body. However, their only one could be released at any one point in time unless the corresponding shepherd had already become a Sequence Three Trinity Templar. Seizing the opportunity that the horn in the female demigod's hand was dissipating, the twisted shaman king reached out and dug out one of his eyes, a bright red, illusory eye. The eye shimmered with a bright, crimson glow as it instantly illuminated the entire room, as though the crimson moon had descended. Its pupil reflected the woman wearing the purple-patterned black robe and a dark-colored hood. Immediately following that, the Shaman King clasped the hand which was holding his eye, letting the crimson moonlight become completely devoured by darkness. A deep darkness appeared around Catalia as the solidified darkness bound her to the spot. It froze the scene. Upon seeing this scene, Bodhis took a step forward, phasing behind his enemy instantaneously, performing one blink followed by another as a total of eight figures dressed in black robes appeared around Catalia. 
These weren't avatars he created, but after images he left behind due to his blazing blink. Some of them released lightning storm, while others condensed a blinding white spear. Some were covered in black armor as they slashed out a heavy broadsword that could appear capable of slicing through anything. Different figures with different powers either attacked or created a form of control, but their target was one and the same, Catalia. There was almost no pause in between their actions. When Bodhis's figure blinked to another corner, he quickly turned transparent as he was on the brink of disappearing. He had no intention of killing the enemy as this was backlumped. Also, the commotion created from their battle couldn't be suppressed any further. Once it affected the outside world, official angels might descend. The reason why he had first launched a series of counterattacks before teleporting away was because he wanted to suppress the enemy and prevent her from interfering with his and Saint Tenebris Kisma's escape. This was a very reasonable strategy. However, a few seconds ago, in a room on an upper level of the old apartment, Zio had learned of all the changes in the venue through Miss Justice's mind voice. Although she was worried and anxious, she didn't panic at all. She followed the plan and jumped down from the window, somersaulting in midair as she pointed at the targeted area. Teleportation is prohibited here. After doing this, she immediately distanced herself from the apartment to prevent the friendly demigods from being distracted. With this interference, the Saint of Secrets, Bodies, failed to successfully enter the spirit world. A rusty, abnormally heavy door appeared in front of him as it tightly sealed the path. To Bodies, an illusory door of this level wasn't able to stop him from leaving at all. He could open the door once he made some adjustments. But at this moment, something anomalous had happened over at the female demigod in the purple patterned black robe. Silver light appeared in Catalia's eyes. They connected together like a mysterious giant snake. This was brief luck, derived from the knowledge she had obtained when analyzing the blood of a snake of fate. Regardless of the terrifying lightning, burning white spear, or the slash of the black knight, none of them hit the target. Catalia seemed to be standing at the eye of the storm. No matter how dangerous the surroundings were, she was unaffected. Those attacks and the attempts at control either narrowly passed her by or were cancelled out by friendly forces. They were unable to achieve the desired effect, and they even helped her weaken the dark shackles. Instantly, Catalia bowed her back slightly as white and illusory feathers grew out of them. They didn't belong to an angel, but rather, a swan. The ugly duckling had become a swan. As for what a swan was, to a sequence 4 demigod, the answer was obvious. It was an incomplete mythical creature form, and the ugly duckling could also become a swan. This was a powerful magic that could allow a mysticologist to reveal their incomplete mythical creature form once a day, with each instance lasting 10 seconds. The surface of Catalia's body immediately cracked open as flesh and blood gathered inside, forming eyeballs with clear blacks and whites. The countless eyeballs coldly scanned their surroundings, as though they were manifestations of multifarious knowledge. As such, the figure that bore their weight turned into a black blob that was even more abstract in a higher spatial dimension. Upon seeing the densely packed eyeballs, Saint of Secrets Bodies and Saint Tenebris Kisma felt dizzy. A knowledge storm took form in their minds. The layer of flesh and blood that enveloped the entire room began to tremble slightly. Some dripped down, while others squirmed intermittently. At this moment, an unimaginable aura pierced through the barrier formed from flesh and blood, pouring into the first floor of the dilapidated apartment and enveloping every corner of the apartment. At the same time, Saint of Secrets Bodies and Saint Tenebris Kisma were shocked. Their bodies, souls, and minds were in an uncontrollable state. This was Dragon Might which had undergone a qualitative change, mind deprivation. Seizing this opportunity, the black blob that was covered in cracks and eyes condensed a spear in front of it. The spear appeared ancient in style. From the tip to the handle, it was dyed in blobs of blood-red splotches. It emitted a mighty destructive aura and a bloody feeling, as though it had once hurt a mighty existence. With a whoosh, the terrifying spear shot out, heading straight for the bodies who stood rooted to the ground. In the entire room, all the voices and details vanished. Even the dragon might that filled the room suddenly disappeared, leaving behind only the bloody spear tip and Bodas's body, as well as the constantly shrinking distance between them. Spear of Longinus Chapter 1197 Mindstorm The blood-stained spear that seemed to come from an ancient time that couldn't be traced had absorbed the entire room's presence, stabbing straight into the body of Saint of Secrets Bodies. The brown-haired, firm-bodied Bodies's figure faded away, turning into a pair of black double doors. At the same time, he appeared behind the door, placing himself in a separate world from the terrifying spear as he looked at it from afar. In the next moment, the spear that was stained with red blood pierced through the black door and bore into the space where Bodies was. Bodies's figure kept retreating, 
constantly transforming into one illusory door after another. Some of them were made up of two winding stone golems, while others had a fist-sized hole by the gaps of the door. Some were embedded with silver nails, while others were covered in mysterious patterns. One after another, they were layered repeatedly, extending to an infinite number. Without a sound, the spear of Longinus tore through the illusory doors without stopping at all. It didn't allow Saint of Secrets Bodies to find a chance to escape. In less than a second, the blood-stained spear that emitted a strong sense of destruction had shattered countless illusory doors. After it suffered a decline in its aura, it finally stabbed into its target's chest. Countless cracks instantly appeared on Bodies's body, as if he was a ceramic object that had fallen to the ground. With a cracking sound, the Saint of Secrets turned pitch black as he disintegrated into pieces, scattering all over the ground. This didn't seem like his actual body, but more like his shadow. This was the shadow substitute spell he had recorded from a certain sequence 3 saint under the true creator. Of course, without the layers of doors weakening the spear of Longinus, he believed that it was very likely that his shadow together with his body would have shattered together. After narrowly dodging this strike, Bodhis endured the dizziness and shock brought about by Catalia's incomplete mythical creature form as he made a gigantic, scaleless silver snake appear in his eyes. This gigantic snake was so large that it filled Bodhis' eyes. Its surface was filled with dense patterns and labels formed by one mystical wheel after another. Its head connected to its tail as it merged with countless illusory rivers, turning into a blurred, surreal, and slowly spinning gear. Around the round gear were all sorts of symbols that represented different futures. Suddenly, the black fragments that had yet to disappear on the ground flew up one after another and reorganized themselves on the spot restoring bodies. The ground that was stained with dark red blood quickly retreated from the numerous illusory doors until it returned to the distorted black blob. The strong, fearful atmosphere receded like the tide and left the room. The black blob that was covered in cracks and eyeballs squirmed and restored itself, turning back into a purple-patterned black-robed woman with a hood. Everything returned to the point before the ugly duckling magic was used. Reboot of Fate this was one of the rewards given to Saint of Secrets Bodies for crushing the Abraham family. He was allowed to record the sequence one Beyonder power from the Angel of Fate, Auroboros. Of course, there was definitely a huge gap from the original version. It could only reboot reality for three seconds, and it was limited to the space of a tiny room like this. It wasn't even able to affect the entire first floor of the apartment. The moment reboot ended, the prepared Saint Tenebris Kisma immediately took action. The gray's twisted shadow that stemmed from a sanguine count spread open its arms and made a gesture of embracing the crimson moon. The darkness around Catalia surged, instantly forming illusory, but firm black chains that bound her to her spot. The flesh and blood that covered the ground, walls and ceiling gathered together rapidly, turning into a knight covered in black full-body armor. He held a heavy greatsword in his hand and looked extremely oppressive. In the gap of the Black Knight's visor, two dark red beams of light flickered and instantly locked onto the hooded woman beside the pumpkin carriage. The shadow beneath Catalia's feet suddenly came alive as it grabbed her ankles. Like a water current that had its water level rising, it gripped her tightly. Black Knight, commandeering shadows. Then, the gigantic knight that was almost reaching the ceiling as though he came from mythical legends rushed to a spot not far from his target with a single step. He cleaved down with the heavy, long broadsword. Elsewhere, a silver illusory book in the eyes of Saint of Secrets Bodies flipped rapidly. It then stopped at a single page. With that, Bodies reached out his left hand and grabbed the pumpkin carriage across a distance of 20 to 30 meters. He then grabbed at the mysterious woman in a purple-patterned black robe. His arm suddenly grew longer, and its surface was black and sticky as if it was flowing with an evil liquid. Amidst the liquid, pale skulls and eyes with pronounced blood vessels grew out, including sharp teeth and tongues. All sorts of strange things grew out, causing extreme evil and extreme madness to spread rapidly through the area. In the room, the ground instantly cracked and the few cockroaches that were still alive collapsed to the ground. This was an attack from a particular state of abomination Sua. Back outside Bayam City, Saint of Secrets Bodies had been attracted by Tinder. It appeared as though he only watched from the sidelines for a while before picking up the item and leaving immediately. But in fact, he had been desperately trying to record the powers or states of the high-level existences. After failing numerous times, due to the frequent blessings of fate, he eventually obtained what he wanted. Of course, during that battle, he only managed to record one. 
under this evil and pitch-black arm, Catalia's consciousness was tainted with madness. For a moment, she was unable to respond effectively. Together with the shackles of darkness restraining her shadow, she could only stand rooted to the ground as she watched Saint Tenebris Kisma's greatsword slash at her while Saint of Secrets Bodies reached out his left hand to grab at her. At this moment, the flesh and blood walls in the room that separated the interior from the exterior was gone. An invisible and abrupt wind stirred up. The moment the wind appeared, it grew violent and swept towards the Saint of Secrets' and Saint Tenebris' hearts. Manipulator, Mind Storm. Not only was he not surprised or flustered by the chaotic thoughts, Bodies even had the corners of his lips pull up as he smiled. As the switch for the reboot, he naturally remembered that the demigod riding the pumpkin carriage had a helper of the same level hiding outside the apartment somewhere. The reason why he placed his focus on the enemy on the surface was to lure out the hidden demigod. In between the two powers of reboot of fate and the abomination state, Bodhis had secretly hypnotized himself, allowing himself to naturally divide the burden of mind deprivation and the knowledge torrent across most of his worms of star. He then left a small number to control his body so as to lock onto the hidden enemy. Previously, the dragons might shock, and the fact that he was unable to discover his target had convinced Bodhis that it was a demigod of the spectator pathway. While his mind was in a daze, the thing he branched out rapidly churned and helped Bodhis locate the source of the attack. But at this moment, most of the thoughts that resonated among the worms of Star wasn't him being overloaded with meaningless information as he had imagined. In his mind, there seemed to be a voice saying thousands of words in a second. At the bottom of an abandoned castle in Delaire Forest, there is a pair of bronze double doors. It seals with the corruptive forces underground. The higher the sequence of Beyonder is when approaching, the easier it is to be affected. The cosmos is extremely dangerous. There are unknown existences watching. Dark Angel is suspected to be the negative personality dissociated from the ancient sun god. What? Bodhis was taken aback. He felt that these thoughts were dangerous, but he couldn't help but wish to understand more. Just this moment of stupor made the enemy he had already found disappear once again, escaping his range of attention. As for the abomination palm that was hurtling towards the pumpkin carriage and the female demigod, it also slowed down. Similarly, Saint Tenebris Kisma was also affected by the mind storm as his actions stiffened for a second. By the time they recovered, Catalia had already opened her mouth and spat out a pea. The pea instantly grew, turning into thick green vines that dragged Catalia out the door, allowing her to escape the shackles of darkness and regain some freedom of movement. By the time Saint Tenebris's heavy greatsword and Saint of Secrets's pitch black arms landed on her, they only shattered a shadow and did not injure this mysticologist. They had shattered Catalia's emperor's new clothes magic, something that didn't exist at all, so she naturally wouldn't be injured. In the next second, the hooded lady in the purple patterned black robe suddenly turned transparent and turned into a pile of foam. The bubbles quickly scattered and burst one after another. Nothing was left behind. As for the green vines, they grew into midair and burst into flames, illuminating the surrounding streets. Everything returned to normal. It was as if the short and intense demigod-level battle had never happened. Saint of Secrets Bodies and Saint Tenebris Kisma exchanged glances. They weren't surprised by such a development. Clearly, after the sneak attack failed, the two demigod enemies were at a disadvantage and could no longer achieve their goals. Furthermore, this was Backland. The longer they delayed, the more dangerous it would be. Hence, they took the opportunity to escape. In addition, in order to interfere with the tracking, they had deliberately created a huge commotion to attract the authorities of Backlund. As for the copy of Leimano's travels and a sequence seven or six apprentice Bayonder, they were baits that could be abandoned. After a slight nod, Saint of Secrets Bodies took out a crystal ball from his black robe's concealed pocket. It bloomed with light before it quickly shattered and merged into the void. He was trying to prevent tracking via mysticism means. Indeed, he didn't dare to stay any longer. He planned on teleporting away and returning to the Aurora Order headquarters. Then, he would interrogate the bait and figure out the truth before deciding what to do next. A second later, Bodiz's figure quickly turned transparent and disappeared. Kisma entered the shadows and rapidly left, wiping the traces behind him along the way. Chapter 1198 Frenzy the Saint of Secrets, Bodies, began to traverse the spirit world the moment he entered, heading straight for the easternmost front of the Sonya Sea, the ruins of the Battle of the Gods. At this moment, his thoughts blurred. His body turned and left the spirit world through another place. By the time Bodies received a warning from his spirituality and had regained control of his own thoughts while feeling tense, what he saw was a bare forest with nearly all its leaves scattered. There was no one around, and the crimson moon hung high in the sky. 
As a former traveler and astrologer, he immediately identified his location and found that he was still in Backlund. However, he had moved from the city to a remote area in the suburbs. At the same time, he also understood what had happened. It was unknown when his mind world had been infiltrated with someone else's consciousness. At the critical moment, it affected his thoughts and changed his destination. That spectator pathways demigod. I didn't realize it. Bodies's pupils dilated as a silvery white illusory book appeared. The book flipped to one of the pages. Bodies immediately raised his hand to grab at his glabella. He grabbed a ball of darkness from the island of consciousness and threw it into his shadow. His shadow was separated from him as it twisted to a stand, revealing a female silhouette. Black Knight, Shadow of Deprivation. This was an ability that Bodhis had recorded from Saint Tenebris Kisma. It could separate one's depraved thoughts into a shadow and form an uncontrollable independent creature. Bodhis used it to erase the consciousness that didn't belong to him and escape the influence of the manipulator. At the same time, this was also Bodhis's counterattack. As long as the hidden spectator pathway demigod couldn't quickly resolve this shadow, the thoughts she had fractured would gradually become independent, turning her half mad and even causing her to lose control. Once he was done with the latent mental problems, Bodhis didn't hesitate to escape the enemy's predetermined battlefield and teleport elsewhere. However, at this moment, his mind suddenly turned frantic. He felt that the entire environment was making things difficult for him, and his anger could no longer be contained. As the silver book flipped in front of his eyes, the entire forest collapsed with a loud bang. The black shadow almost collapsed into a ball. After his bout of mania, Bodhis's mood dropped to a nadir. He couldn't lift his spirits with regards to anything. He felt that he was useless, a burden to others and even the world. Mental Plague In the previous battle, Bodhis had already been infected by mental plague, and it had finally acted up. The reason why Catalia first used the little match girl magic wasn't only because she wanted to interfere with Bodhis's teleportation, but also because she was helping Miss Justice conceal any traces, allowing her virtual persona to infiltrate Bodhis's mind world without triggering his spiritual intuition. A seed of mental plague was planted secretly without triggering it. It was precisely because of this that when the sneak attack failed, Catalia and Audrey dared to initiate the contingency plan. They retreated on their own accord, allowing Saint of Secrets Bodies and Saint Tenebris Kisma to separate from each other after they were out of danger. Catalia's final igniting of the final green vine appeared to create a huge commotion to attract the attention of the official Bayonders, making the enemy abandon their pursuit. But in fact, it was to force the Saint of Secrets to leave as quickly as possible. This way, he didn't have the time to carefully examine and check his condition at a deeper level. Hence, at the critical moment of his teleportation, he had his thoughts changed by Audrey's virtual persona. He came directly to the outskirts of Backlund, an uninhabited kill box which the Tarot Club had chosen. And once he finished off the manipulator's virtual persona, the eruption of mental plague came right on the heels of that. In fact, if he had used Reboot of Fate earlier, he definitely would have been able to return to a state where there were no latent problems. However, he only decided to use this trump card when he was nearly killed by the Spear of Longinus. And by that time, his mind world had already been infiltrated for far more than three seconds. He was dispirited and depressed, trying his best to resist his mental illness. It was at this moment that he saw a bunch of surreal yarn balls appear out of the void in front of him. At the back of the yarn ball, the bright colored yarn extended into an infinite distance. Following this line, Catalia, who was wearing a purple patterned black robe and a dark colored hood, walked over from the spirit world and appeared in front of the Saint of Secrets, Bodies. She was unable to track down enemies that had done some level of interference, but she could establish a connection with the predetermined battlefield. She could trace Justice Audrey's virtual persona. The moment she arrived, Catalia closed her eyes and formed a phantom image that fell towards an invisible coffin. The already depressed Bodies instantly felt extremely exhausted. He couldn't help but close his eyes, wanting to collapse. Sleeping Beauty On the other side, Audrey's virtual persona which hadn't fully turned independent was like a dark shadow, bringing with it a sense of depravity. She raised her hand and pinched her forehead. Her pupils silently turned vertical. They were pale gold and cold. Bodies's mind instantly exploded as bubbles of light appeared on the surface of his body. Within the bubbles, rays of starlight condensed into insects with their heads and tails fused into the void. Psychiatrist, frenzy. This could completely trigger the target's emotions and even cause him to lose control. 
Bodies had already been infected with mental plague and was in an extremely abnormal state. Following that, he was affected by sleeping beauty magic and was in an extremely dispirited mood. Frenzy now triggered everything, immediately making it difficult for him to control himself as he showed signs of losing control. Seizing this opportunity, Catalia opened her eyes, raised her right hand, and rapidly formed a handful of spinning star sand in her palm. The forest beneath the night became even darker. The crimson moon disappeared from the sky as stars appeared one after another. They were densely packed and dazzling. The stars scattered their rays of light, forming a magnificent pillar of light that enveloped the area around Saint of Secrets Bodies and his surroundings. In the midst of the shock, Bodies became a little more awake. His figure rapidly turned into a blur as he kept blinking, creating more than ten afterimages in the forests. However, he could not escape the starlight's envelopment, nor could he teleport away. One by one, the starlight melted and dissipated the different bodies. Finally, there was only one person left genuflecting, propping up his body with one palm as he struggled. Bodies's body was in shambles. His eyes were already dark red, and he appeared to be on the brink of insanity. When the starlight was in its final moments, he blinked and dodged the follow-up attack of Audrey's virtual persona. Then, he kept blinking and created doppelgangers beside Catalia and Audrey's virtual persona. One of his doppelgangers grabbed with his left hand, distorting the area where Audrey's virtual persona was located. He concealed it in a bid to restrain the enemy. As for his other doppelganger, he spread open his arms and summoned a thick pillar of light surrounded by holy flames, letting it blast down into the concealed space. During this process, Bodhis's other doppelganger had secretly removed the concealment of space. Hence, as soon as the shadow corresponding to Audrey's virtual persona was freed from the restriction, it was enveloped by a holy pillar of light, quickly melting away. In his blinking state, Bodhis could use Bayonder powers at a speed faster than normal, but he couldn't sustain it for long. This was something that was achieved via using his numerous Worms of Star. Elsewhere, the Saint of Secrets, Bodies, was also attacking Catalia. He had used various powers, and in the short span of a second or two, he had inundated his target with a barrage of attacks. This forced Catalia to constantly use the Emperor's new clothes magic to avoid it. She was momentarily unable to counter-attack and was in grave danger. A few seconds later, Bodies's blinking finally slowed down. The mania in his heart also eased. At this moment, grayish white and heavy scales suddenly appeared outside the forest. They were faintly discernible, as if they were forming an extremely oppressive behemoth. In the dark night where the crimson moon was obscured, a nearly invisible stream of breath swept down from top to bottom, enveloping Bodhis and Catalia. The two demigods felt as though they were struck by lightning as their psyche was torn apart. Their spirit bodies seemed to be penetrated. The breath of a mind dragon. With his mental state already in a terrible state and having used a couple of his trump cards, Bodhis's mind went blank. As the flashes flashed before his eyes, his body couldn't help but tremble. As for Catalia, she was carrying the moon paper figurine that she had obtained from Force. This helped her bear the burden of psychic piercing once. Although it was unable to completely eliminate the effects of mind dragon breath, it could help Catalia recover faster. This meant an opportunity in a battle at the demigod level. In just a second or two, Catalia's eyes returned to normal. As for Audrey who was in her dragon form and hiding in the darkness outside the forest, she cast another mind deprivation on Bodhis. Without any hesitation, Catalia raised her right hand and condensed the terrifying spear that was stained with fresh blood. She threw it at the Saint of Secrets, Bodhis. This time, Bodhis could no longer dodge or resolve the situation. His chest was pierced through by the Spear of Longinus. His body stiffened for a moment before it rapidly collapsed, turning into countless dazzling worms of star. Some of these worms of star vanished directly, while others devoured each other. Some of them fused into a distant spot, forming a new Bodhis. There was no longer any rationality left in his eyes. His body was continuously collapsing, revealing an incomplete and extremely weak mythical creature form. At this moment, an illusory door appeared beside him. It was grayish blue that had seven brass locks. The illusory door quickly opened as it spat out a three-layered jewelry box embedded with various gems. The box of the great old ones which had been exiled had returned. With a crazed look in his eyes, Bodhis caught the box, revealing a cruel and bloodthirsty smile as he tried to open it. The Third Level Chapter 1199 An Auspicious Box Towards the return of Bodhis's Grade Zero Sealed Artifact or the restoration of its normal condition. The Hermit Catalia and Justice Audrey had made a preliminary plan. After all, they weren't confident at killing a demigod in such a short period of time. 
if not for the fact that Bodies had fallen into a trap having suffered the lethal blows of mental plague, sleeping beauty, and frenzy and putting him into a crazy and incoherent state. He actually had many opportunities to teleport away without being stopped. In that case, Catalia and Audrey could only wait for Bodies to return to a safe house and release force. Once the Eye of Mystery Prying provided them feedback, they could remotely create an opportunity for Miss Magician to summon the historical void projection. At this moment, facing Bodies, who was on the path towards losing control with no way to reverse it and his crazy attempt to fully activate Grade Zero sealed artifact, Catalia and Audrey, one right in the middle of the scene and the other hiding outside the forest, simultaneously took the same action. They took out a translucent dark charm and recited a word in Jotun. Star, this was a teleportation charm. Following the patterns, labels, and symbols of the record on the Leimano's travels, Klein had made a charm himself. Since Sephira Castle could mobilize the powers of the Marauder Pathway, there was no reason not to respond to the pleas of the Apprentice Domain. As for the materials needed for the charms, be it Mysticologist Catalia or Traveler Fours, the both of them had a certain level of understanding towards it. There was no need for Mr. Fool to teach them. When the two of them teleported away with the triggering of the charm, having plans to come back after a minute or two to confirm the situation, there was a cruel smile on Bodies's face. His eyes were filled with madness as his actions suddenly stiffened. No matter how hard he tried, he couldn't open the third level of the box of the Great Old Ones. It was extremely heavy, as though it was enveloped and suppressed by layers of forces. There was no way to activate it. This made Bodies feel like he was attempting to open a new world, not a box. In an instant, he sensed something, and the madness in his eyes disappeared. Extreme astonishment and fear arose in him. Tick-tock, tick-tock, wisps of light slid down from Bodies's body. When they touched the ground, they transformed into insects formed from resplendent starlight. The insects' bodies were bent into a semicircle, forming a magical glow that resembled illusory doors. At this moment, his incomplete mythical creature form suddenly collapsed and disintegrated in an irresistible manner. The two eyeballs of his eyes landed on the ground and were stained with dust. These two eyeballs were frozen with an indescribable look of horror. They were maintained perfectly, completely different from the other parts of his body. A sequence four secret sorcerer died just like that. Pa, the box of the great old ones, which had a silver black surface with many gems embedded in it, dropped beside Bodhi's eyes, just like a jewelry box commonly seen in aristocratic families. Above the gray fog, in the ancient palace, Klein heaved a sigh of relief as he lowered the sea god scepter in his hand in puzzlement. He was just moments from activating the power of Sephira Castle and using the level of an angel to conjure lightning storm. He wanted to prevent Bodies from opening the third level of the box of the Great Old Ones, but the Saint of Secrets' mutually destructive counterattack had failed to succeed. He encountered an unexpected failure from the very beginning. After Zeo left the first battlefield, she immediately followed the plan and prayed to Mr. Fool. With this, Klein found an opportunity to enter the world above the Grey Fog. Through the Crimson Star corresponding to the Hermit in Justice, he monitored the battle. As she moved to the second battlefield, Audrey found an opportunity to pray so that Klein could use her Crimson Star to directly interfere with the real world. This was also the reason why Audrey had arrived at her destination later than the Hermit Catalia. According to what Erod said, the third level of the box of the Great Old Ones contains something very terrifying. I thought that the true creator had given it to him in order to create a terrifying disaster at the critical moment, so as to showcase the true colors of an evil god, who knew that it couldn't be opened. Klein glanced at the crimson star representing the magician and discovered that it was covered in a layer of black ash. It seemed to have coagulated, making it impossible for him to see the scene inside to confirm Miss Magician's condition. This was the first time he had encountered such a situation evidence of how high a level and odd the box of the Great Old Ones was. As for Sleeping Beauty Magic and the Spear of Longinus that he saw, he came up with some ideas. After learning of the powers of mystical reenactment at the private gathering, Klein overturned his speculations about the fairy tale magic that Bernadette had. He had originally believed that the Emperor had specially created the stories for his daughter based on the fairy tales on Earth, or that after Bernadette's father passed away, she had deliberately reenacted the fairy tales he had told her about as a way to express her grief. From the looks of it, the answer likely wasn't this. Some of the fairy tales before the first epoch might have been mysterious. This meant that those fairy tales originated from mysterious incidents that had happened in real life. They were spread among the people and gradually became stories. They were recorded down by writers and further embellished. This corresponds to the prophecy regarding the time when the stars are right. Mystery and has never left and has always been around. 
it was just that in the Earth era before the first epoch, they were suppressed by some kind of power or sealed. If that's really the case, some of the legends and stories on Earth can be explained from another angle. It's no wonder there's a spear of longinus. I wonder if the Chinese fable of the ethereal utopia, Peach Blossom Spring, is involved in mystery. I'll tell Ma'am Hermit later and see if she can create new magic according to this. I wonder if Bernadette became a mysticologist before the Emperor perished. If she did, it's hard to say if these fairy tale magics were created by the Emperor, a sequence one beyonder of the mystery prior pathway, or by Queen Mystic Bernadette. But no matter what, the Emperor should have discovered that these fairy tales are also mysterious in his later years, and also that he could draw power from them. Well, there's no corresponding diary entry from Bernadette. I can't see the Emperor's reaction and his guesses. One of the reasons he insisted on going to the moon is to verify certain things. It's a pity that most of the myths are fake. There's no way to draw on their power. The novels of the internet era are the same. Klein sighed slightly as he leaned back into his chair and continued paying attention to the battlefield. In the collapsed forest, the hermit Catalia and Justice Audrey faced the abnormal changes suffered by Bodies and tacitly gave up injecting their spirituality to use the charms. Despite maintaining her dragon transformation state, Audrey was still hiding in the darkness outside the forest, wary of any accidents or official demigods who might have sensed the commotion and come to investigate. As for the hermit Catalia, she was pushed to the spot where Bodies had died by the wind. She carefully avoided the box of the Great Old Ones. Due to the fact that a scribe could use many powers, a demigod-level sealed artifact would often have extremely negative effects. Apart from the box of the Great Old Ones, Bodhi's only left behind a black pocket which seemed to be part of his robe. Also, there was also the gathered Beyonder characteristic, two eyeballs, and about ten worms of star. Most of the worms of star had been destroyed. Considering the horror displayed by the box of the Great Old Ones, as well as the fact that Bodies was a high-ranking member of the Aurora Order and could be blessed by a god, Catalia didn't rashly pick up the items. She was afraid that an accident would happen, causing the situation to develop negatively. Previously, during the private gatherings, they had communicated with each other on how to handle such situations. That was, if they had the time and opportunity, they would first sacrifice the item to Mr. Fool and then distribute it above the gray fog. After all, many items might bring about unknown dangers if they were to come into contact with items with unknown negative effects, and there was a high probability that Bodies had a grade zero sealed artifact. Sometimes, merely knowing the existence of a sealed artifact of this level was enough to cause a sudden death. According to what the Star Leonard had said, it was best not to come into contact with such sealed artifacts. It was best not to ask, describe, or pry into it. Only a true high-level existence could suppress them. Without any hesitation, Catalia took out silver candles and other ritual items from the various hidden pockets of her purple patterned black robe. She then set up a simple sacrificial ritual. During this process, she pinched her lips, whistled, and created an invisible servant helper. It took about 10 seconds to set up the altar. After quickly reciting Mr. Fool's honorific name and using spiritual materials to open the door of sacrifice and bestowment, Catalia heaved a sigh of relief. She got the invisible servant to move the box of the great old ones, the black pocket, two eyeballs, the gathered Beyonder characteristic, and the nine worms of star over to the altar. With a whoosh, the items flew up and passed through the illusory door. When Catalia saw this, she immediately pinched her lower lip with her thumb and index finger, preparing to whistle once again to dispel the invisible servant. But amidst the whistling, the servant remained motionless, as though it had nothing to do with Catalia. The hermit Catalia's eyelids twitched as she clenched her right hand into a fist and pushed it to her mouth, preparing to use the horn of magic. At that moment, a blazing silvery white appeared out of nowhere at the altar. Layers of bolts of lightning formed a destructive storm that enveloped the invisible servant in the middle. All of this quickly calmed down as the mutated servant was completely destroyed. Catalia exhaled and lowered her head, sincerely thanking Mr. Fool. Then, she followed the ritual's ending procedure and packed her belongings. She used the Snow White magic, which was closer to a prophecy technique, to clear the scene of its traces. And at this moment, Audrey had already used the teleportation charm from before and left the scene. Catalia looked around, and considering that Mr. Fool might need something more ritualistic, she took out a card from her pocket and threw it in the middle of the collapsing forest. The card was half inserted into the soil, revealing the image of an old man holding a glass lamp and staff as he explored alone, the hermit of the tarot cards. 